Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, material to cover, and it should be rather interesting. Um, I'll go through and discuss uh, a number of items. Uh, I'd like to ask everyone if they have questions that come up, if you could just make a note, and then at the end, we can address all the questions at once, and that might be the most efficient. So uh, thanks very much again for joining, and let's go ahead and get started. So we have uh, uh, on the agenda today, I'm gonna give a brief overview of Keysight uh, and internet infrastructure, which is the group that I work in, uh, then talk about transmission lines, which is a very important part of signal integrity. And then um, the measurement metrics. So measurement science is very important for understanding the high-speed digital channels. Then we'll get into some practical applications and what printed circuit board issues pop up in the everyday life of a designer. And uh, we've got some real world measurements that we'll look at with uh, time domain and frequency domain, looking at a Zowie backplane. And then I'll give a, a brief demonstration of the physical layer test system. And, uh, and that's what it looks like today. So I'm gonna go ahead and carry on. So uh, of course, Keysight started as the Hewlett Packard company back in 1939 with Bill and Dave. And then we uh, we spun off HP and started Agilent. And then um, over the past five, six years, we spun again and went to Keysight. And so I've been with the company for about 25 years now. So I was uh, in the beginning with HP. And uh, of course, our whole idea uh, of being a tested measurement company, we've come full circle back to the original founder's intention and focus in on, on test and measurement. And now uh, it feels good to be back into the HP way doing things in, in the Keysight name. So my, my goal in, in this um, job that I'm in is to work with the internet infrastructure uh, industry, uh, looking at the high-speed data that transmits through our, our network and data centers and our hyperscalers that use these big routers and server farms. And I want to describe what's going on here. So in the upper left, we have the components, uh, transmitters, receivers, amplifiers, and these get put into modules like gigabit ethernet uh, modules. And those get mounted onto line cards, which are printed circuit boards that plug into a big back plane that's in a, a, a rack. And even though that the long haul is optical fiber, the majority of the electrical signals being uh, transmitted are, are pure electrical. And so we need to look at the electrical characteristics of the channel. And that's what we're gonna do today is focus in on the, on the interconnect. And of course, Keysight has uh, many different products in its portfolio, uh, starting from the components all the way through the hyperscalers and the enterprise and looking at the different mobile test base, um, network test, electrical and optical, what we're gonna focus on today is the components and the chipsets. And more specifically, we're gonna look at what we call layer zero in the OIF, optical inner networking form definition. And these are the linear passive interconnects. So this is gonna be our devices under test today. So what are those specifically? Well, they're things like backplanes, printed circuit boards, IC packages, not the IC itself, because that's active, but the package is passive. Of course, connectors like this backplane connector and cables. So signal integrity problems are basically in all of these devices. And so the backplanes themselves are a critical link. Why? Well, it turns out that even though microwave engineers um, tend to feel their, their design is, is more difficult, today's high-speed digital data rates are such that even small, short printed circuit board traces have become microwave transmission lines. And there's not just one or two nets that we need to design as high-speed digital engineers. It's a whole bevy of channels on a backplane. It can be hundreds of channels. 
this is the challenge today uh, of what we must take a look at and look at EMI susceptibility and crosstalk and frequency domain and time domain analysis. So specifically, why is signal integrity becoming such an issue? Well, all the high-speed digital buses have gone from parallel to serial. And as the serial channels have faster data going through them from 100 gigabits per second to even higher data rates, the rise time from a transition from a logical zero to a logical one becomes faster. So shorter, faster rise time signals, as those propagate through a given printed circuit board trace, any impedance discontinuity like we see in this green trace, where there's a narrower trace that's excess inductance or a wider trace that has excess capacitance, the faster rise time gives a bigger reflection even though nothing's changed with that channel. All we've done is have faster data being pumped through. So what the realization is, is that now we have to use frequency domain data in, in conjunction with our other tools like time domain and eye diagrams. So let's talk about transmission lines. If you look at the traditional classical model of a transmission line, we have uh, series resistance and inductance, and then we have shunt conductance and capacitance. And the only reason I mentioned this model is because if you look at the bottom formula, Z naught equals the square root of that, that ratio. If we look at um, the a, a perfect transmission line with no resistance or conductance, and we look at J omega approaching one, we basically have Z naught equals the square root of L over C. What that means is if the impedance of a transmission line increases, that means one of two things has happened. Either the inductance has gone up or the capacitance has gone down. So if you simply focus on that ratio of inductance to capacitance, you can always be assured you're going to have a controlled impedance environment. And that is what controls the signal integrity in our high-speed digital channels. So if you just remember one formula for the whole presentation, Z naught equals the square root of L over C. Okay? Now, because of high-speed digital data transmission, we found a way to have noise immunity by going to what's called differential architecture. So what, what that means is now we have equal and opposite polarity data being transmitted on two adjacent PCB traces. And this helps us and gives us things called CMRR. CMRR stands for Common Mode Rejection Ratio. And what that means is that any incident radiation on this differential pair that you see here, if it's designed properly, this differential channel should reject any noise incident on this. So this gives us EMI uh, non-susceptibility. This is a good thing. We don't want crosstalk from other switching power supplies to affect our high-speed digital channel. So this is why we go from a single-ended architecture to differential architecture for many of our high-speed channels. However, with that CMRR benefit, there's a little bit of a downside because there's some complexity that becomes involved. Rather than a single-ended line, which you can perfectly define with just two parameters, which is the electrical length, which is the propagation delay, and the impedance. Now, with a differential architecture, we have a characteristic impedance matrix. So it's a two by two matrix, and it tells us the coupling factor, depending on how close these two traces are to each other. So there's trade-offs that are always being made when we go to more more noise immune architectures.
Okay, so now that we know we have to think about differential architectures, let's take one step backwards and look at the single-ended S parameters. And S parameters are scattering parameters, and that's what we get when we use a vector network analyzer. And they're just reflection and transmission terms. Looking at the green graphic in the center, we have two traces, and let's say that they're separated far enough, there's no coupling, so they're treated as a single-ended uh, system. So if you look on the left-hand side, we have all the scattering parameters or S parameters that are single-ended that perfectly describe this system in the green. And on the right-hand side, we have a four by four matrix of the time domain parameters. And the point I wanna make here is that each of these elements in each of these matrices have a one-to-one -one mapping and one maps into the other with a mathematical formula, whether it's either a fast Fourier transform or an inverse fast Fourier transform. So if, if we as digital designers, let me, let me tell you, I, I took one course in field and wave theory at university and I said, forget it, I'm going digital. And, and it turns out in the beginning, it was simple with zeros and ones, but as data rates increased, now we have all these transmission lines and we have to think about things in both time domain and frequency domain, but we don't need to be intimidated by S parameters. If we understand time domain, then we can inherently map one-to-one -one into frequency domain. For example, if we look at the blue diagonal elements on the right from T11 to T44, this is just reflection terms we call TDR or time domain reflection. If we do an FFT on all of those four diagonal elements, we get S11 through S44, which is what we call return loss. Likewise, on the right-hand side, the terms in yellow, we call time domain transmission. On the left-hand side, those are just insertion loss. And we have the same analogy for near-end crosstalk and far-end crosstalk. So the point is here, if you understand time domain, frequency domain is just an extension of that. Okay. Now that we've looked at single-ended S parameters, remember most of the high-speed digital is now differential circuits. So we need to go the next step and look at differential S parameters. So there's one thing that's our benefit when we talk about linear passive interconnect. Again, backplanes, PCBs, connectors, and cables. When we're only talking about those types of devices under test, we have something called linear superposition theory that allows us to take those single-ended S parameters that we just talked about and turn them into differential S parameters or balanced S parameters. And so we're gonna go just a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole here and talk about differential S parameters. And that's gonna be uh, the, the most technically challenging thing we talk about today, but I think it's worthwhile to do. Okay, looking at the differential S parameters, we can break them into four quadrants. In the upper left in red, quadrant one, upper right, quadrant two, lower left, quadrant three, lower right, quadrant four. Quadrant one in red is the most important one that we always start our analysis in first, because this is the real world. Differential signal in, differential signal out. This is how all of the circuits operate. So we want to look at differential return loss. This would be SDD11. We want to look at differential insertion loss. We look at SDD21. Quadrant four in the lower right is not so critical, but we get those parameters for free when we make the measurement. Quadrant two in the upper right and three in the lower left. These are probably the most interesting because we call these mixed mode S parameters. This tells us about EMI susceptibility and EMI emissions. In other words, this can indicate where we might have crosstalk problems.
But in a perfectly designed differential circuit, we should have no mode conversion. We should have 100% of the differential signal going in and 100% of the differential signal coming out. So that's in a perfect world. Well, we know that's not the case. So there's always going to be some amount of mode conversion. Okay, so this is kind of the fundamental model that we use when we start describing and analyzing all of our channels using differential S parameters. And just to show an example of what these look like when you plot them in red and blue, we have the differential insertion loss curves. And the way you can tell it's differential insertion loss, it, they start at zero because we should have no loss at DC, at zero frequency. As we go up in frequency, there's a Gaussian roll off for the frequency response. And at high frequencies, we have more loss. And this can be dielectric loss or it can be um, series loss due to skin effect of the PCB copper. But this is traditionally what differential insertion loss curves look like. And we're just comparing micro vias to standard vias. And of course, micro vias with using a laser with a small diameter are, are more effective and higher performance electrically. So there's less loss at higher frequencies. That's why the blue curve is above the red curve for insertion loss at the high frequencies. Okay, then we look at differential return loss. Those usually start at very low values. So minus 30, minus 40 dB is very low value of reflection. And as you go up in frequency, you get more reflection. Okay, so these are typical return loss, insertion loss curves. So how do we make those measurements? Well, we can do that a couple different ways. We can do it with a digital communications analyzer oscilloscope, like on the left, when you have uh, TDR plug-in modules. And in this case, we would take measurements in the native time domain. And then of course, we can use um, FFT algorithms and look at frequency domain. On the right-hand side, we have a vector network analyzer, and this happens to be what we call a scalable vector network analyzer with a uh, EXI chassis. So each slot has a vertical uh, module that plugs in that's a standalone two-port VNA. So we can go all the way up to 32 ports up to 53 gigahertz with this one machine on the right. And you can see with all the cables, we can end up with a 32 port S parameter measurement. And then if we wanna look at time domain, of course, we can use IFFTs and we can look at TDR and TDT and those things. So being able to go back and forth between time and frequency can be very insightful when you're doing design and troubleshooting. The main difference here between these two pieces of, of test equipment that are in most signal integrity labs is this. On the left, the scope has a very wide bandwidth receiver. So what that means is that we'll have a little bit higher noise floor. So the dynamic range is not quite as high. You know, maybe with averaging, you get minus 60, minus 65 dB. On the right-hand side, the vector network analyzer has a very narrow receiver bandwidth. What that means is as we narrow the bandwidth, the system noise level goes way down. So we can then expect to get very high dynamic range with the VNA. Why do we care? Well, let's say that you have to measure very small crosstalk levels where it may be difficult to pull that small signal out of the noise floor. Well, that's a good example of where you'd use a vector network analyzer to, to look at very small signals. But again, most signal integrity labs use both TDRs and VNAs, okay? Just to show you what the flagship product might look like, here we have uh, the world's highest frequency 
vector network analyzer broadband of 120 gigahertz, which gives you an equivalent six picosecond effective TDR rise time. Uh, why do we care about that? Well, this six picosecond rise time gives us 400 microns of spatial resolution. So remember I said, uh, as the data rates increase, we have shorter and shorter transmission lines that are created. So when we get into BGA packages, even the packages become very short trace transmission lines. And so this is a case very commonly where this sort of system needs to be used. But for most part, if you're looking at a PCB trace that's maybe six inches or 12 inches long or, or more, um, you don't need this much frequency resolution. Either 26 gigahertz or 50 gigahertz is more than enough. Here's an example of the physical layer test system, which comprised of a software, which is running on a PC, and then it controls the calibration and measurement of either the VNA, like we show here, or the TDR. And then once we make that measurement, uh, we can then save that data in a library and then recall it at our desktop in our cubicle and do post measurement analysis and look at I diagrams, time domain, frequency domain, and even do some simulation based on multi channel simulation. And so I'll show you how this works at the end of the presentation. So here's an uh, I diagrams um, of two different formats. Um, you should be a little familiar with I diagrams. It's pretty much the, the standard for high speed digital uh, parameter analysis. On the left left hand side, we have what's called non return to zero, which is just two levels of logic, zero and one. And of course, as you increase the data, we double it from three and an eighth to six and a quarter gigabit per second. And as you increase the data rate, the eye closes and it starts to encroach on that eye mask and gives a failure. On the right hand side, for higher data rates, we go to what's called PAM4 or Pulse Amplitude Modulation Level 4. And here we have four levels of logic, 0, 1, 2, and 3, with three eye diagrams. The same idea, if you increase the data rate, the eyes start to close at the end of the channel where the receiver is trying to uh, decide the logic level uh, between the data. And if the eye closes too much, then you need to perform certain tricks with the receiver equalization. But for the most part, our goal is always to have open eyes at the receiver. Okay. Let's take a look at some practical PCB issues now that we've kind of laid the uh, foundation for all of the theory that we need to understand. So practically, when you start looking at PCB manufacturing and you get a board in from your vendor, you assume that it's been tested 100%, but maybe it's not, and maybe you need to do some incoming inspection. Well, you're gonna use either a TDR or a VNA, and these are some of the problems you might encounter when you do that. If you look at the little vignette number one, here's a case where we have excess capacitance in a through hole. And remember, if you have too much ex excess capacitance, remember that formula was the only formula that I asked you to remember. Z naught equals the square root of L over C. So if you have too much capacitance, what happens to your impedance? Well, if you think about it, that capacitance is in the denominator. So if that denominator gets bigger, then the ratio is going to get smaller. So your impedance will go down. Okay. So this is how we use that Z naught equals square root of L over C. Number two, you might see some localized crosstalk between the differential pair and vias. This can happen. Number three, we can see localized changes in conductor width. So if you have a void, on one leg of the differential pair and not the other, well, that's going to create an impedance discontinuity at that point. And so that's going to give a reflection, which is not good because that will close the eye at the receiver. In a similar manner, you might have a piece of solder that drops on one leg and not the other. 
Well, that's going to also be an impedance discontinuity, cause excess reflections, which is not good. And number five, you can have reflections due to a via stub. And we'll talk about that briefly in the next slide. Number six, you can have non-uniform dielectric material. Mostly FR4 is the most cost effective, but you can go to more exotic materials to try and minimize that non-uniformity. And you have, the goal is a homogeneous dielectric system. Number seven, you can have surface treatment thickness non-uniformity. Number eight, you can have localized changes in the foil thickness. And number nine, this is something that IBM discovered a few years ago called anodic conductive filament shorting or AFC shorting. So these are all problems that we can have. And as engineers that are designing PCBs, we need to be able to find these problems and troubleshoot them. Okay, let's take a look at via stubs. This is a, a common uh, signal integrity problem that, that is encountered quite often. And if you want to avoid them, you can do things like back drilling. But let's say for a moment, you're, you're not aware of what back drilling is. Well, when you have a through hole to get to different layers, you drill all the way through the PC board typically, and you plate everything. But let's say that your signal carrying conductor starts on layer one, it comes in and it goes halfway through to maybe layers five or six, and then comes out on layer five or six, okay? Goes on its merry way. Well, layers six through 10, they're still gonna have that piece of copper hanging out there that's not being used, that's unterminated. And that acts like a little antenna and it's what we call a via stub. And for if you look at the instantaneous current flowing through that via, you're going to have two 50 ohm PCB traces in parallel for a short distance. And if you have two 50 ohm traces in parallel, what is your impedance going to be at that point? It's going to be 25 ohms, right? Just half. So this 25 ohm impedance discontinuity is going to be um, causing uh, reflections and it's going to close the eye. So what you can do to get around that is, as I mentioned, you could actually back drill, but you have to be very precise with the back drill. Okay, so via, via um, stubs is an issue that you need to be aware of. Now, many times I'll be working in a signal integrity lab of one of our customers around the world and we'll be troubleshooting their channel and they'll, sh they'll have a prototype and Mike, I, uh, They'll say, Mike, I need to uh, pass this, you know, 20 gigabit per second signal through. And it turns out, I think I picked the wrong connector. I, I, I'm getting too, met, too much of a reflection for my connector. Uh, so I, maybe I just need to get a better connector. Well, it turns out, if you take a look, an exploded view of a typical backplane connector, we have all the plastic injection molding, and then we have some me metallic shielding, but the differential signal traces are actually designed quite carefully to have very good CMRR, very good common mode rejection ratio, and they're typically well balanced within each pair. And it turns out that most of the reflections are not coming from inside the connector. It turns out most of the reflections are coming from the planar to coaxial transition between the connector and the PCB board. Okay, so whether it's press fit, uh, which, which we talked about vias and causing uh, impedance discontinuities, surface mounting will help, but there's still issues there. And so we need to be aware that it's not always the connector, but it can be that transition between the connector and the PCB. Now, let's take a look at some real world measurements in a backplane to uh, re, uh, reinforce that idea of uh, the problem being at the via. So here we have a typical backplane. This happens to be a Zowie backplane running at about three and an eighth gigabit per second. 
On the right, we have our scalable vector network analyzer, and we've hooked up our, our back plane, and we're measuring all the differential channels here. Now, being a, a digital designer, I'd like to start in the time domain. So let's look at TDD11. Uh, so this is a reflection in quadrant one, right? Differential in, differential out. That's how it works in the real world. The signaling is going to be quadrant one. And if you look at a TDR impedance profile, which you may be familiar with, it's impedance in ohms in the vertical axis, and it's distance or time in the horizontal axis. So if you look at this trace starting on the far left, Here's our 50 ohm uh, or 100 ohm differential cable coming in. And the first thing we see is excess capacitance followed by an excess inductance. And these are fairly large reflections. Well, this is this gold coaxial connector right here. There's 3.5 millimeter connectors. Then we have uh, a short transmission line. And there's a little ripple there, but it's fairly well controlled. Well, that's the daughter card. And, and this is the section from this gold connector to the input of that backplane connector. Now, this huge reflection here is that excess inductance or excess capacitance. Well, if we look at, remember, Z0 equals square root of L over C. If we keep um, L constant, uh, we know that capacitance has to increase for the impedance to go down. So this is excess capacitance, and that turns out to be the via between the daughter card and the backplane connector. Okay, with me so far? Now, we have an extremely short transmission line. Well, these are those differential traces that we saw in the exploded view of that backplane connector. It's very short, so this is, this is what, we, uh, what we have looks like this. Then we have another coaxial to planar transition on the output of this backplane connector. That's what this is right here. Then we have a very long, well-controlled impedance environment, and this is the backplane channel from one connector to the other. Now we're at the other end. We still have the two via reflections for this backplane connector, but here's a question. This backplane connector, all of these are identical. So this, this far one on the right is the same as this far one on the left. Why do they look so different? This is much less reflection. Shouldn't it be the same? Well, remember we talked a little bit about insertion loss. So this backplane has a FR4 dielectric, which is typically very lossy. So all TDRs work this way. We have a step that gets launched into the channel and that 200 millivolt step from the TDR module gets degraded and the amplitude decreases as it goes all the way through this dielectric, lossy dielectric. And so this, this looks like a much smaller reflection because of the amplitude degradation of the dielectric loss. So we always want to look at the closest port to the input of the TDR for the most accurate. Well, what if we want to measure this one out here? What do we do? Well, we simply flip the device around and we, we look at the input from the other direction. And it turns out with the four port measurement, we already have that information. So SDD21 is the insertion loss going left to right. SDD12 is the insertion loss looking from right to left. Same with time domain. Time domain transmission, TDD21 is going left to right. TDT12 is going from right to left. So we have all the information we need in that one four port measurement. Okay? Now, when we get out of the R&D lab and we start doing production, uh, we want to be very efficient and use one piece of test equipment. And this test equipment can be either a TDR or a VNA. Um, but since we have the narrow bandwidth on the VNA with more dynamic range, that's typically the, the tool of choice. And so when we use this physical air test system software for post-measurement analysis, 
we can look at time domain, frequency domain, eye diagrams, all with just one measurement. And we're doing all that FFT, IFFT, one-to-one -one mapping automatically with the software. So this is this is now something we can do extremely fast and quickly jump from one domain to the other, which gives us a tremendous amount of insight being able to bounce back and forth. And so here we can look at the impedance of the connector, the near-end crosstalk in the time domain, the insertion loss in the frequency domain, near-end crosstalk in frequency domain, far-end crosstalk in frequency domain, in this case, we're looking at the super speed and the legacy D plus D minus of USB 3.0. And then there's that common mode. Remember that? That common mode signal is quadrant four. And then the I diagrams, both NRZ and PAM4. So this is really a way to do multiple measurements, multiple domain analysis with just one simple test system. And this, in fact, is what most printed circuit board companies do. Uh, in Taiwan, which is kind of ground zero for PCB manufacturing, and also China, southern China, Shenzhen, there's a lot of uh, PCB manufacturing going on. Most of the um, manufacturers do exactly this. Okay, just a very quick mention about air correction. Um, Everything that we do has to be with a piece of test equipment that's calibrated, right? If you don't calibrate your test equipment, you, you, you're sacrificing the accuracy. And there's a whole alphabet soup of, of different types of calibration. And the one thing I just want to mention to you briefly is something called automatic fixture removal. AFR, as it's also known as, is able to remove the fixture from the measurement so that you can focus on not the performance of your test fixtures, but just the performance of your device under test. And so we've got all of these different types of error correction in all of our different tools at Keysight, but the one that we found is most helpful for printed circuit boards is this AFR. So uh, we could talk probably another three hours on this topic, but I'm just gonna mention it briefly and then you can actually do some research on your own uh, later on if you'd like. Now, I wanted to mention um, it's so easy uh, as an expert in one specific piece of test equipment for signal integrity, I can, I can talk and go into much detail, but your job is much more difficult than mine you need to have multiple tools at your disposal. And, and it's easy to get overloaded with all of these tools. And by the way, the learning curve is not extremely easy either. And so one of the things that you, you, you wanna think about doing is try and use a piece of uh, test equipment that can give you as much use and flexibility as you can uh, to give you insight into different domains. And so this is what we tried to do with physical air test system is to integrate all of these different um, parameters and analysis techniques into one tool. So um, with that in mind, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague here, Alan Knox from Sierra Circuits. And he's got a typical application that you can see a picture of him here. And Alan, uh, maybe you can say a few words of how you use this system in your day-to-day -day work. I'm glad you, Mike. Um, we have a typical problem here at Sierra. Uh, I use a VNA to measure S parameter data in our lab, but our manufacturing department uses a TDR to verify performance, and the customers are all using eye diagrams. So the physical area test system software allows me to view the test results in multiple convenient formats and compare the results. It brings everything together without a long learning curve or, or a lot of complex math, and we didn't want to spend money on an PLBS gen pattern generator either. So the multi-channel simulation feature of the PLTS worked just great for us. And that uh, sums it up for me, Mike. Great. Well, listen, we, uh, we appreciate uh, all of the work and collaboration that we've done together and, and glad to see things are working well for you. So if you have uh, applications like printed circuit boards or connectors or cables, any linear passive interconnect, uh, this will work exactly in the same fashion 
and test methodology for you. So uh, what I'd like to do now is maybe wrap up the portion of uh, the presentation uh, in PowerPoint with a few uh, uh, more links that you can do more research. Um, you can get a lot of detail from this keysight.com slash find slash PLTS. Uh, real good application notes there, videos. And also there's a, a book that I wrote on signal integrity. I co-authored with Dr. Eric Bogatin, who you may have heard of, um, a long-term colleague and friend of mine. You can uh, download the, the PDF of the book for free going to this uh, link here. Um, so at this point, I think what I'd like to do is do a, a short demo uh, of the PLTS to give you a feeling for what it does and how it works. And then we'll go into a short Q&A session. Okay, so uh, just as confirmation, uh, can you see me launching the PLTS application now? Yes. Thank you. So the first thing that this software will do is it will ask you, hey, are you in the laboratory connected to a VNA or a TDR? Because if you are, uh, I can calibrate it for you and make measurements. And uh, in this case, no, I'm, I'm at home, uh, in my home office. I don't have test equipment. But this would be like if you were in your cubicle doing post-measurement analysis. So you could say maybe you did your S-parameter measurements yesterday or last week. And so I'm going to go in and I'm going to launch the, the application. If you were in your lab making measurements, this is what you would do. You'd go to new measurement. You'd say perform a new calibration. The instrument would be uh, identified. Uh, you'd set your start and stop frequency. And then you'd go through and it would step by step show you how to do a calibration. And you'd easily apply the calibration kit to all ports. And then it tells you uh, connect it open to port one. Now hit a short to port one. Now do a load to port one. And you, it just walks you through step by step. So it's very easy. You don't need to be a VNA expert. Uh, you know, it, it's something that is uh, very user friendly. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use it in the mode where I'm going to do post measurement analysis. And so what I've got here is I've got this. Uh, USB connector, and I usually like to start in time domain just because I'm a digital guy. Uh, I could just as easily look at frequency domain, I diagram, RLCG, or use a custom test template. But let's start in time domain, differential. And so since this is a four port measurement, we have two input and two output. Remember those two matrices, the time domain and frequency domain? So we have a four by four matrix, and here's the four quadrants, quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, quadrant four. And remember, quadrant one is the one that is the real world. So let's start there. And here, TDD11, well, here's my impedance profile. And uh, I'm going to change these vertical units from millivolts into ohms. And I do that just by clicking on this third button from the right and then doing a right mouse click to auto scale. And now I can actually uh, change my uh, my horizontal units per division, and I can zoom in. And you may notice, recognize some of these vias here that are excess capacitance. I can drop a marker anywhere I want and read impedance off of any place. And so the worst case via here is down to 85 ohms, even though our target goal was about 100 ohms, 110 ohms. So this is a very quick and easy time domain type of analysis. TDT looks like this. We look at the fast rise time and how much the amplitude is degraded. Now, just as easily, we can look at frequency domain. So we click on this button up here under the data browser that says frequency domain balanced. It opens up a blank canvas for us. And we go down here to the parameter format selection and we click on the button all. And bam, we just did a uh, fast Fourier transform on all of those time domain matrices elements. And so here we have the analogy of the impedance profile, which we call differential return loss. Remember we say it starts around maybe minus 30, minus 40 dB, and it goes up. 
And then here is differential insertion loss. Remember, we say it starts at zero and kind of rolls off in a Gaussian fashion. And then here we have some noise of our test system. So this is time and frequency domain that we can look all of the quadrants and, and do our analysis. Um, something that uh, we can also do is eye diagram analysis. So eye diagrams, we can simply click on one button and create an eye. And this is a uh, mathematics that is well known where we synthesize the eye. Now, uh, this isn't very well filled in, but I can easily go in here and I can uh, go to my, my bit pattern and I can, uh, I can increase the pattern length, let's say two to the ninth minus one. And then I can go and, and redraw that. And then I fill my eye in. And now if I wanna start creating a template, like I did that one time, I just go into limit mass template and I say create and it'll automatically align a mask for eye diagram analysis. And I simply uh, change the, uh, the eye height and make it so that I can go down and create a passing eye. And this is a way that you can actually grade various levels of quality. You just have different masks for different applications. And, and so this is a, a very nice way to control your yield in production if you wanna have different eye masks. And so what you end up doing is creating a template for your manufacturing technician. So as a designer, you're gonna go through a number of prototype designs and you're gonna find your golden prototype, right? The one that works in the application exactly the way you want. And after you do that, you're gonna take that golden prototype, you're gonna measure S parameters, and then you create templates. You're gonna make limit lines for insertion loss and return loss. You're gonna put masks on the eye diagram. And once you do that, you can email that, that, that template to your manufacturing line, whether it's in another building or another country, and they can use the same system in PLTS and do all the 100% manufacturing tests. This is in fact what happens around the world. So we have about five, 500, 600 users worldwide. And uh, to give you an idea of what one of these masks do, remember we showed that one in the PowerPoint presentation and all we did was we looked, we give you some of these pre-programmed uh, masks, but we also make it easy for you to create your own. And in this case, if I wanted to start from scratch, I could just go into USB connector. And there is my template that we showed in the PowerPoint presentation. So I've got multiple domains that I've been able to do pass fail on with just one test system, one measurement. I, I did one calibration, one measurement, and I can create these templates and it tests everything that I need to, time, frequency, and eye diagrams. So, so this is the benefit of using um, a test cycle where the R&D engineer uh, measures and analyzes the golden prototype and then transfers that technology over to his manufacturing engineering group and allows them to do high volume testing. And, uh, it's hard to do um, a lot of um, very uh, detailed demonstrations here, but uh, there's lots of um, homework that, that you can find on our websites. And so I would encourage you to, uh, in fact, go look at the, uh, at the app notes and uh, you can download our, our free 30-day uh, trial of PLTS at no cost and do some playing around and, and we can, we can send you sample uh, S parameter files to play with if you don't have any. So at that point, um, I think what I'd like to do is uh, is wrap it up. And I think we've got maybe uh, maybe five minutes for Q&A and uh, I'm happy to, to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, 
that was a very great presentation. Uh, so guys, feel free to ask your questions in the Q&A section on Zoom. And uh, in the meantime, I can just tell you a few things about CR circuits. So I know that most of you already know us, but uh, we are a PCB design support, manufacturing and assembly facility. We are in Sunnyvale, California, and uh, we specialize in prototyping. Uh, with very complex designs and advanced materials. But just last year, uh, I'm not sure a lot of you know, but we opened in Wisconsin a high volume facility. So now we can also take care of your mass PCB production. Okay, Mike, I think we have <laughs> one question regarding the cost. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna just repeat. There was a question about uh, the slides, and yes, I can send the slides to uh, Lucy, and she could distribute to everyone. And then I have uh, another question: PLTS cost. Um, you know, we have a, uh, um, a PLTS uh, subscription based license that starts at three thousand dollars, so it's not a real big investment to get started. And then. Uh, Another uh, question, how do I know what Insight VNAs can use PLTS? Um, well, there's uh, there's quite a lot of learning materials and application notes and uh, design con papers. And, and I mentioned my my uh, signal integrity book. There's, uh, there's a lot of information that you can uh, study to see uh, all of the uh, multitude of applications. Uh, PLTS is... Uh, been around for probably 15, 20 years now. So it's a very mature, very powerful um, signal integrity tool. Uh, do you have MIPI eye mask? You know, uh, good question. Uh, we've got all of these templates here, but uh, the eye mask can be imported. So if you have a, uh, a mask that you'd like to use, uh, you can simply hit the import. So we'd go limit mask. And here you could just say load. And when you load, uh, it's gonna look for an XML file with the PLT, PLTS limit lines. So there is a way to, uh, to import masks that you may have for your application. Uh, let's see, Mike asks, can you comment on back drilling versus blind vias with respect to cost and reliability? Um, this is a really good question. You know, um, I don't have a lot of experience on PCB um, manufacturing, but but I can I can tell you that um, back drilling requires a very precise CNC machine to consistently and reliably uh, back drill to the right depth. If you don't back drill far enough, you still leave a little bit of a stub which you can live with, but is not desirable. If you drill too far, you create an open circuit, which kills your, your channel. So, um, so the, the blind via in this case is probably uh, the more desirable choice. Um, you know, I would say it's, it's more reliable. I'm not aware of what the cost implications are. So um, apologize for that, Mike. Any other questions? Again, I would really encourage you to uh, to go to the PLTS uh, website, and uh, I'll put that up again just so you can see. Um, so it's uh, www.keysite.com slash find slash PLTS. And uh, many you know, 20, 25 app notes, uh, we've got a YouTube channel. You can also search on Google. And then uh, for the uh, for the PDF of my book, uh, you can just uh, find slash reso book and you'll go right to it. So I know there's a lot of information here, uh, but I think that um, anything that you do to, to increase your learning makes you more valuable to your company. So I would go ahead and encourage you to do so. 
Uh, let's see. Troy's got a question here. Thank you for giving this talk today. I have a pretty broad question as an engineer early in my career, but what resources books have been most influential in your understanding of high-speed digital design? You know, I have to say, um, as much as I'd like to plug my own book, uh, there are better ones. Um, the The book that I published is a group of design con papers, which maybe target the intermediate to advanced user. If you're starting out, there's a couple good books that Dr. Bogatin has written, and um, so I would I would encourage you. Uh, Eric Bogatin has has uh, got a website, and it's uh, www.bethesignal.com. And he's uh, also a professor at uh, University of Colorado Boulder. So um, he's got a couple good books that would be a great starting point for you. Uh, my book is more uh, aimed toward the intermediate. Also, what is the solution for companies or groups that don't have the resources to outright buy this expensive test equipment? You know, you can rent them. So you go to uh, uh, to companies like uh, Rentelco or... Um, you know, Keysight also has a, uh, um, a, a division that we actually uh, give loans so we can actually finance for you. So, uh, you know, if you if you want to start with a lower frequency four port VNA, which I do recommend you have four ports, right? Because everything's differential. You need two input, two output. But you can start with a, you know, relatively inexpensive 10 gigahertz four port and um, and and get yourself rolling. Learn the methodology, learn the details of calibration, learn how to do basic analysis, and as your experience uh, grows, you can move up to more expensive equipment that goes to higher frequency. Good question, Troy. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we're done with the questions. Uh, thank you everyone for attending the webinar. Thank you very, very much, Mike, for presenting. And, You're welcome. Uh, yep, thanks. Okay. Thanks to everybody for joining. Alan, thanks very much for your help. And uh, welcome. thank you. Have uh, have fun and uh, keep learning. That's the key to uh, to our, our jobs as engineers. And, and this is what makes you valuable. So have fun. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye now.